Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1149 of This Week in Amateur Radio. A new video is available on YouTube which documents the removal and preservation of a Collins 250 kilowatt transmitter rescued from the soon to be leveled Voice of America Delano relay site in Central California. New approaches to tackle RF noise problems vary and many remedies remain quite elusive. We will have a full report. Ofcom, the regulatory body in the UK, is proposing a new amateur radio RF exposure requirement. Astronauts on the space station, along with NASA and the European Space Agency, continue to troubleshoot problems with one of the amateur radio stations on board the station. AMSAT DL in Germany is tracking various probes on Mars. A high school in Wyoming, after a failed attempt, finally has a successful ARIS school contact. We will bring the contact directly to you. The U.S. military has developed what it calls a quantum receiver, which can detect signals from DC to 20 gigahertz. How would you like to have that in your shack? We'll tell you all about it. North Carolina's amateurs develop a pandemic compatible way to have successful monthly mini tailgate ham fest. We'll tell you about them. And an amateur has assisted in the development of a new blue light sensitive solar panel that someday will be used to beam energy back to earth. We will have all the details coming up in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about a lot of things this week, including how one company learned the hard way not to let interns make up passwords. He will tell us how a recent software update may have your Roomba vacuum seem a little bit drunk. He will tell us about a new side-loadable browser extension that blocks sites that ping Google and Amazon, among others. He will speak to the recent closure of Fry's Electronics on the West Coast, and he will have audio and comments about the recent UFO sighting by an airliner over New Mexico. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will answer the propagation question, how many hops in a jump? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill begins a two-part series looking at the history behind amateur radio full duplex relay stations. What are they? Well, they're better known as repeaters. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about what precautions you need to take and the advantage of doing your tower climbing at night. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our HEPA-filtered headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from along the southern shore of Lake Ontario on a windy day in Rochester, New York, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from Mud Station Zebra in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where we're expecting some 50 and 60 degree temperatures this week, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And reporting from our sunny but frigid news bureau in Troy, New York, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2RJX. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we seem to be coming out of winter's cold grip, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now, with our lead story this week, here is Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. Leading off the news this week. With the former Voice of America Delano Relay Site in Central California scheduled for eventual demolition for resale, the Collins Collectors Association, in association with the Antique Wireless Association, came up with a plan in 2014 working, among others, 
with past ARRL Midwestern Division Director Rod Bloxham, K0DAS, a former Collins engineer, to retrieve one of the Collins 821A-1 250 kilowatt HF transmitters from the site and put it on display at the Antique Wireless Association Museum in Bloomfield, New York. The control room and the Collins 250,000 watt transmitters, once used by Voice of America at its Delano Relay Station in California, is transmitting history now instead of U.S. government broadcasts that began during World War II into the Pacific Rim and Central and South America. The Delano site, known as DL-8, went on the air in 1944 with a 170-foot rhombic antenna. The Collins 821A-1 transmitter was auto-tuned and could shift frequencies between 3.950 and 26.500 MHz in 20 seconds. The transmitter and its associated components represents serious heavy metal. The Delano site, now owned by the General Services Administration, remains with antennas still standing, the buildings still in place. The scheduled demolition is currently on hold because it was discovered to be the habitat for an endangered species of shrew. A video presentation featuring Dennis Kidder, W6DQ, describes and illustrates the entire removal and relocation effort and offers some background on the Voice of America. On the continental U.S., the only remaining Voice of America site is the Edward R. Murrow Greenville transmitting site in North Carolina. The UK regulator, Ofcom, has decided to go ahead with their plans to introduce an electromagnetic field strength clause into the amateur radio license. It will be in place no later than May the 18th, and there will be at least a six-month grace period to comply. Among the consultation respondents quoted in Ofcom's announcement was Raynet UK. Raynet UK, a national voluntary communication service provided by amateur licensees, commented on training aspects. It said that training activities may be no-notice activities to provide the best training experience, but the relatively narrow scope of Ofcom's exemption for emergency situations may limit these activities. Mike White of South Wiltshire Raynet also commented on the impact of Raynet's activities, saying that emergency deployment by Raynet on behalf of Category 1 responders would be more problematic, thus reducing the resilience capabilities and contributions of radio amateurs. Raynet UK also pointed out that Ofcom's proposed definition of the general public is overly restrictive, in that it only accounts for a single licensee or operator responsible for the transmitter. It asked who would be considered as the licensee in scenarios where there are multiple operator stations and whether an off-duty operator in the vicinity would be defined as a member of the general public when they do not have a microphone in their hands. Regarding EMF training, Ofcom said, We recognise that appropriate training for amateur licensees provided by the Radio Society of Great Britain can help licensees ensure members of their household are not exposed to electromagnetic fields in breach of the ICNIRP general public limits. We will encourage the RSGB to update their training to include the most relevant and effective ways in which amateurs can comply with the EMF condition, as identified in our Guidance on EMF Compliance and Enforcement. The RSGB will also be asked to provide training on our additional guidance for radio amateurs, which will be published in a draft version shortly. Such training should not be treated as a one-off tick-box exercise. It is likely that a revised syllabus and textbooks for the RSGB amateur radio exams to incorporate the new EMF requirements will be required at some point later this year. Ofcom acknowledge that their EMF calculator tool will in most cases overestimate the safe separation distance needed for a human from the antenna, and in addition it is not suitable for use below 10 MHz. Ofcom say, we expect to publish our final decision in relation to the variation of affected licenses no later than the 18th of May 2021. Where we decide to vary licenses to include the EMF condition, licensees will then have six months to ensure that their EMF compliance records are in place and up to date, which will be extended to 12 months in relation to equipment which operates at frequencies below 10 MHz. 
We may decide to extend these deadlines for compliance if there are ongoing travel restrictions as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we'll publish an update on our website if we do decide to extend these deadlines. Following the conclusion of the license variation process, Ofcom also intend to include the EMF license condition in all new licenses in the affected license classes. The EMF condition will apply immediately to any licenses that are issued and include the new EMF condition. While the license variation process is ongoing, we will still accept new license applications and issue new licenses. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. RF noise is a frequent discussion topic among radio amateurs. A proliferation of electronics has cluttered and complicated the noise environment. It's not just power lines anymore. Here with a look at this continuing and sometimes escalating problem is Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this special report from League Headquarters. Various approaches to address the worsening noise floor are being taken around the world. We all want to enhance our ability to copy the weak ones by increasing our signal-to-noise ratio, Alan Higby, K0AV, said in his March-April NCJ article, tracking RFI with an SDR one source at a time. He continues, Lowering the noise floor increases the relative strength of weak signals, and he adds, locating and eliminating RFI sources is a never-ending process. The International Amateur Radio Union warns against complacency. Radio amateurs cannot sit back because even if the desired noise limits are agreed, there are many rogue manufacturers and dealers who will happily sell noise-generating devices, leaving out filter circuits to cut costs, IARU said. The IARU has urged member societies to get involved. The FCC Technological Advisory Council, the TAC, encouraged the FCC to undertake a comprehensive noise study in 1998. It has cautioned the FCC against implementing new spectrum management techniques or initiatives without first getting a handle on the problem. There's a lot more on this vast topic on the ARRL website, www.arrl.org. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Unless isolated from civilization, most hams experience RF interference, or RFI, sometimes without even realizing it. Although spectrum scopes on modern transceivers make RF noise much more apparent. The FCC Technological Advisory Council, a commission advisory group, initiated an inquiry in 2016 looking into changes and trends to the radio spectrum noise floor to determine whether noise is increasing and, if so, by how much. In 2017, the FCC Office of Engineering and Technology invited comments on a series of spectrum management questions. ARRL in its comments took the opportunity to strongly urge the FCC to reinstate the 2016 TAC noise floor study, which, ARRL asserted, was terminated before it even got started. ARRL urged the FCC to depart from the traditional regulatory model that placed limits only on transmitters and called for a holistic approach to transmitter and receiver performance. Greg Lappin, N9GL, represents ARRL on the TAC and chairs the ARRL RF Safety Committee. Perhaps the best result that we obtained was an indication that illegal devices, mainly LED lights, were in circulation and the Enforcement Bureau agreed to look into it, he told ARRL. We never heard what they found out, but recently, I was buying some LED bulbs over the internet from a site in Texas, and they were selling non-FCC approved lights and didn't seem to care. Lappin said his complaint went nowhere, and the TAC focus has been nudged in the direction of addressing 5G issues. 
Some national regulators are paying attention to noise complaints, although not necessarily from users of licensed services. Participants at the 2017 International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Conference in Germany devoted considerable discussion to noise issues and the need to monitor the noise floor. The Deutsche Amateur Radio Club has been working on developing a noise measurement system that approximates methods used by the International Telecommunication Union radio communication sector. DARC reported that 35 of these electrical noise area monitoring systems, or ENAMs, have been delivered and it's seeking another 20 locations as part of the effort to monitor noise interference on the HF bands. DARC said the ENAMs can help to make scientifically reliable statements about interference levels. The IARU Region 1 EMC, or Electromagnetic Compatibility, RF Noise Measurement Group, meets quarterly to share ideas and experiences. One project under consideration is development of a common database to gather output from various monitoring stations for further analysis. The IARU seeks wireless power transmission, or WPT technology, as an impeding major noise threat, especially from WPT electric vehicle charging systems. For the amateur service, given the planned density of WPT EV systems, it is calculated that there will be widespread and serious impact on its operation in the vicinity of WPT systems from spurious emissions, said a 2019 publisher's article written by amateur radio societies concerned about the HF noise floor. The article also said to ensure a low probability of harmful interference to radio communication services, further study is required, including evaluation of real equipment, mitigation techniques, and other measures to improve WPT EV systems. The South African Radio League is encouraging radio amateurs to set up their own RF noise monitoring systems using a dongle and a Raspberry Pi. The HF noise monitoring system takes 12 by 1 megahertz bandwidth samples every two minutes, saving the data to a file. Amateur Radio on the International Space Station International Chair Frank Bauer, KA3 HDO, reports that the ARIS team has been working closely with NASA and the European Space Agency to identify what may have caused what ARIS is calling a radio anomaly on January 27. With more details, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who has this report from League Headquarters in Newington. The net result has been an inability to use the NA1SS ham station gear in the ISS Columbus module. For the time being, Irish school and group contacts with crew members are being conducted using the ham station on the ISS service module. The radio issues came in the wake of a January 27th spacewalk, which involved rerouting the antenna cabling to the ARIS radio system aboard Columbus. Tests this week using the APRS system to determine the operational status of the ARIS radio in Columbus by using three different cabling configurations were not successful. As we're reporting this on March 5th, astronauts carrying out a spacewalk may be able to troubleshoot the problem outside the ISS. Through a great deal of coordination with NASA and the European Space Agency, ARIS will be conducting a set of automatic packet radio system tests to determine the operational use of the ARIS radio system in Columbus through the employment of three different cabling configurations. Over the next couple of days, ARIS will be performing a series of tests using our APRS ability with standard 145.825 MHz APRS frequency. The crew will be periodically shutting down the radio and swapping cables so ARIS can troubleshoot the radio system and the cabling. Bauer said precise swap times will depend on crew availability and expect that the test will run through sometime in the next few days. We cannot guarantee these troubleshooting tests will resolve the radio issue, Bauer said but we encourage ARIS APRS operations in this time span. Bauer said that if the tests were unsuccessful, a contingency task has been green-lighted for a March 5th spacewalk. This EVA task would return the ARIS cabling to the original configuration prior to the January 27th EVA, noting that a contingency task will only be performed if time allows. Bauer said the APRS users not to send contact emails or social media responses, and this would overwhelm the ARIS team. 
But if you definitely hear the packet system working or are able to connect through it, let us know the date, time, and the grid square of the occurrence, he added. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a podcast at our website, www.twiar.net, and streamed worldwide via Spotify and iHeartMedia. The Spring 2021 Red Cross Nationwide Emergency Communications Windlink Drill will be held on May 8th, which is World Red Cross Red Crescent Day 2021. Details and instructions are available. Sign up for email updates. Ahead of the May nationwide exercise, the American Red Cross Emergency Communications Training Group will continue its Windlink Thursdays training sessions on March 11th and April 8th. For two amateur radio operators aboard the International Space Station, it was their moment in the sun. NASA flight engineers Kate Rubens, KG5FYJ, and Victor Glover, KI5BKC, took the first moves towards a power upgrade for the space station during a seven hour and four minute spacewalk to outfit the new solar arrays with modification kits. If the view for observers was a little more spectacular than usual, consider that Ruben's helmet held a high definition video camera for the first time and was streaming the action live. Videos had been taken previously using a helmet cam, of course, but only with standard definition. NASA was quick to point out that the present solar arrays on the ISS are working fine, but they're degrading and are approaching the end of their useful life. The spacewalk was designed to prepare for the installation of the new solar arrays, which are expected to be sent to the ISS aboard a SpaceX vehicle starting in June. Meanwhile, there's still work to be done. NASA officials said that the upgrade is to be completed by Friday, March 5th, with Rubens returning accompanied by another amateur radio operator, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Sochi Naguchi, KD5-TVP. U.S. Army researchers have built a so-called quantum sensor, which can analyze the full RF spectrum and real-world signals, a report on physics.org says. For more details on this fascinating device, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from ARRL headquarters in Newington. The quantum sensor, technically a Rydberg sensor, can sample the RF spectrum from 0 to 20 gigahertz and is able to detect AM and FM radio signals as well as Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and other RF communication protocols. The peer-reviewed Physical Review Applied published the researchers' findings. As the article explains, the Rydberg sensor uses laser beams to create highly excited Rydberg atoms directly above a microwave circuit to boost and hone in on the portion of the spectrum being measured. The Rydberg atoms are sensitive to the circuit's voltage, enabling the device to be used as a sensitive probe for the wide range of signals in the RF spectrum. Kevin Cox, an Army researcher, called the development a really important step toward proving that quantum sensors can provide a new and dominant set of capabilities for our soldiers who are operating in an increasingly complex electromagnetic battle space. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Cox went on to say that earlier demonstrations of Rydberg atomic sensors were only able to sense small and specific regions of the RF spectrum. But our sensor now operates continuously over a wide frequency range for the first time. The technology uses rubidium atoms, which are excited to high-energy Rydberg states. These interact strongly with the circuit's electric fields, allowing detection and demodulation of any signal received into the circuit. The report says the Rydberg spectrum analyzer has the potential to surpass fundamental limitations of traditional electronics in sensitivity, bandwidth, and frequency range. According to Meyer, devices that are based on quantum constituents are one of the Army's top priorities to enable technical surprise in the competitive future battle space. Quantum sensors in general, including the one demonstrated here, offer unparalleled sensitivity and accuracy to detect a wide range of mission-critical signals. The researchers plan additional development to improve the signal sensitivity of the Rydberg Spectrum Analyzer, aiming to outperform existing state-of-the-art technology. 
significant physics and engineering effort is still necessary before the Rydberg analyzer can integrate into a field testable device, Cox said. New Zealand's regulator, Radio Spectrum Management, the RSM, says that the RF spectrum has become an important economic resource, but its usefulness is diminished by pollution. The regulator has produced a compliance guide to give radio spectrum users and suppliers of electrical and radio products information about compliance requirements, compliance audits and enforcement. Radio Spectrum Management supports the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment objective to grow New Zealand for all by making sure that the radio spectrum is clean and by also maximising its use. Ensuring that licensing and product compliance requirements are met is crucial to achieving this objective. The compliance guide can be viewed at www.rsm.govt.nz. Just navigate to the publications section. The New Zealand regulator has also produced an information leaflet regarding unrestricted two-way radios. The leaflet can be downloaded on the Radio Spectrum Management website under Products and Equipment You Can't Use in New Zealand. This is part of an ongoing campaign to stop people from using prohibited equipment, in particular unrestricted two-way radios. It took only a half hour as Ofcom, the telecommunications regulator in the United Kingdom, responded swiftly to an urgent report of widespread RF interference, calling it a high-priority case. With more details on this unusual case of RFI, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, who files this report courtesy of Southgate Amateur Radio News. The UK regulator Ofcom sent an engineer out just 30 minutes after receiving a report of interference to unprotected license-exempt devices, and they say they treated the case as high priority. Many customers in a supermarket car park could not use their key fobs to open their cars. In their report, Ofcom said, Ofcom's Spectrum Management Centre, based in Baldock, Hertfordshire, provides a 24-hour service to industry and to members of the public by monitoring the radio spectrum. This service also allows people to report radio interference. On Friday the 26th of February, an officer from Hertfordshire Police contacted Ofcom to make them aware of the problems at the supermarket car park. Car key fobs, like lots of other everyday technology, use radio spectrum to operate around and about 433 MHz. On rare occasions, faulty or unauthorised equipment can interfere with nearby technology and prevent it from working properly, such as in the case of these customers' fobs. Due to the nature and scale of the problem, Ofcom assigned this as a high-priority case and sent out a local engineer who was soon on the scene to investigate the problem. He used a spectrum analyzer, a piece of equipment which measures the airwaves and detects any radio signals that shouldn't be there. However, at that particular moment, the problem wasn't actually happening, and customers were able to lock and unlock their vehicles successfully. So, Ofcom asked staff at the supermarket to get in touch if any more customers reported further issues over the weekend. As a reminder, hams in the UK should report any and all interference to Ofcom via the internet. After 74 days at sea and over 2,900 nautical miles of solo rowing, Gidek Sude arrived at the Caribbean island of St. Bartolome. He set off from the Canary Islands and eventually arrived on February the 26th. On board, there was an experimental WSPR beacon of less than one watt, operating at 10 megahertz, and the antenna was a shortened diamond mobile whip. The system design by Anthony Lacren, Foxtrot 4 Golf Oscar Hotel, and Maurice Eugène, Foxtrot 6 Charlie India Uniform, worked wonderfully throughout the crossing, despite two capsizes, with antenna and beacon equipment being submerged for several minutes. The designers say it's planned to undertake this exercise again, this time on a voyage from Cape Cod in the USA to Brest in Brittany, France. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a stream to your favorite digital device on Spotify, TuneIn.com, Overcast, iHeartMedia, and wherever you download your podcasts. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Uh, let's see. Don't let your interns set your passwords. Solar winds. Remember this hack the uh, that basically allowed, uh, we think Russia, not, don't know for sure, but we think Russian, uh, the Russian secret police 
to spy on the Department of Defense, everybody, Microsoft, everybody. The way they did it is they hacked a security company called SolarWinds. So Congress brought the uh, SolarWinds CEO, former CEO, <laughs> I guess he got fired, I don't know, former CEO in, along with Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, to testify on Friday about how did that happen? How did that there happen? SolarWinds CEO, well, that's not, that's not former, that's current. SolarWinds CEO, Sudhakar Ramakrishna, was asked by uh, Representative Rashida Tlaib, Oh, no, wait a minute. No, this is, yeah, it was former SolarWinds CEO. He was also there, Kevin Thompson. He was asked about how come the password to get into SolarWinds updates was so easy? He said an intern did it. <laughs> and, it and not only an intern did it, but an intern did it in 2017. That's what Ramakrishna said. You know what the password the intern set was? SolarWinds123. <laughs> My favorite quote from uh, Katie Porter, our own uh, our own uh, representative here in California. I've got a stronger password than SolarWinds123 to stop my kids from watching too much YouTube on their iPad. You and your company were supposed to be preventing the Russians from reading Defense Department emails. <laughs> you should let Katie Porter set your passwords, not your interns, I guess. That's the... Oh, boy. You may remember that stimulus funds were passed out in March, the first stimulus bill. The uh, state of Mississippi got $1.2 billion in federal money. And you know what they decided to do? I love this. They decided to take a, a chunk of it, not a lot, not a huge amount. Well, uh, I mean, they got $1.2 billion. They decided to take about, oh, I don't know, $75 million. Not a huge amount. And uh, create the Mississippi Electric Cooperatives Broadband COVID-19 Act. A lot of words, which basically said, give money to internet service providers, especially in the rural, hard-to-reach areas of Mississippi, where there's no service or very slow service, give them money to build out their infrastructure so we can get internet service to the entire state. So they, they gave them cash, and then the, the grant required they, they match the funds because they're going to make some money on this. Fifteen electric co-ops got $65 million in grants. I don't know what happened to the other $10 million. Uh, but they had to spend it. They got it in March. They had to spend it by December, which means they all went crazy trying to deploy high-speed broadband. But that's good news. That's good news. The CEO of Coast Electric Power Association, which serves the areas of Biloxi and Gulfport, by November had had their customers to 100 megabit to gigabit service. Five months took them. They did it. That's a good model for spending your tax dollars. Get them online. Beef up the internet. It's good for everything. It's good for people. It's good for business. It means you can listen to me on my podcasts. It's good for everybody. Yes. Oh, has your uh, go home Roomba? You're drunk. Have you noticed your Roomba acting funny? Your iRobot vacuum cleaner. Some uh, users of the Roomba i7 and S9 say uh, that the. <laughs> One one user described their robot cleaner as acting drunk after the uh, 3.12.8 firmware update, spinning itself around and bumping into furniture. <laughs> These are the little vacuums. You've seen them probably uh, on social media with cats riding on them. They look little circles. They wake up at night. Usually it's at night because you don't want them vacuuming during the daytime. They wake up at night and they go around and they vacuum. <laughs> and the they have this, uh, you know software in them that says okay uh here's where furniture is here's where stuff is vacuum all around that and do a pattern that gets the the floor clean everywhere after this update <laughs> roombas were bumping into furniture cleaning in strange patterns just getting stuck in an open empty area not getting home to the dock they have to get home to the dock after the you know after they vacuum they go back to charge so they always leave enough just enough juice to get back to the dock maybe this has to do with the fact that the map the Roombas make of their uh, of their house were wiped out that's what some users are reporting in some cases Roombas are taking longer to the cleaning the house to barely working at all so <laughs> go home Roomba you're drunk there will be an update somebody made a browser extension you know browser extensions you can put these on your browser this one works on uh Chrome or I think on Firefox, you have to sideload it. 
But the idea, it's from the Economic Security Project. The idea is it'll block any sites that ping Google, Facebook, Microsoft, or Amazon. The big four tech companies. Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Amazon. It's called Big Tech Detective. Now, I'm not recommending it. According to Mitchell Clark in The Verge, he said, <laughs> when you put it on, basically, you can't do anything. So many websites, almost all of them, including, by the way, mine, now that I think about it, contact Google, Facebook, Microsoft, or Amazon in some form or fashion. So if you put there this Big Tech Detective on, it'll show you a bunch of locked pages. I guess it's for educational purposes. You certainly wouldn't want to use it all the time. But it just shows how dependent we are on, on four companies pretty much run the whole thing. Or at least they got their fingers in the pie. And it's a sad day. I used to do ads up in Northern California for a great electronic store. You remember, your best computer buys are always at Fry's. Guaranteed. Not anymore. After 36 years in business, Fry's Electronics. <laughs> In nine states, 31 stores. Remember the store? All oh, the stores were so fun. They had, there was one that was Egyptian. There was one that was the future. One was the past. There's actually a list. Did, was there one in Alice in Wonderland? Did you go to that one? Professor Laura says she liked the Alice in Wonderland store. No, they're, uh, they're, they're closing down. If you go to fries.com, their website. They said we're going out of business permanently as a result of changes in the retail industry and the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. They began the wind down three days ago. Mm -hmm. I'll always, in my mind, I'll always think your best computer buys are always at Fry's. There's a Wikipedia that has all of the, I think, different themes, store themes. Aztec Temple, Golf, Space Shuttle, 1950s Science Fiction, Ancient Egypt, Steampunk, Ruins of Ancient Rome, 1893 World's Fair, Manhattan Beach had Tahiti, Agricultural History, Wild West. They put all their money into that. That's the problem. City of Industry. Let's see what the City of Industry had. The Industrial Revolution, Steampunk. That's what it had. <laughs> San Diego. Yeah. The 1950s Sci-Fi. Woodland Hills. That's the Alice in Wonderland store that Professor Laura frequented. Automobile racing in Indiana because of the Indy 500, I guess. The Las Vegas Strip was all about Las Vegas. Uh, Austin had live music. Dallas Cattle Ranch, Houston Oil Derricks. Plano, Texas had railroads. Webster, Texas International Space Station. Renton, Washington Regional History. A lot of them had regional history. Your best computer buys are always at Fry's. Guaranteed. Yeah, I would, the San Jose store is the one. The Mayan Temple Chichen Itza was the one I went into. And Sunnyvale was history of Silicon Valley. I think I probably spent some time in there, too. Never did have a San Francisco store. And no Petaluma, either. I think it, you know, frankly, Amazon and Newegg and all the online places you could buy the same things probably just is the end of the line for not only fries, but a lot of retail outlets. It was just fun to go in. I wasn't going. I never went shopping. I just walk in. They say men don't like shopping. Show them a fries. Uh, let's see. What else is uh, in the news? This was a flight from Cincinnati to Phoenix last weekend. Uh, the pilots saw something. And the something they saw was captured by a guy named Steve Douglas. He does a uh, an aviation blog, Deep Black Horizon. And apparently he was both listening and recording, you know, as, as one does. Sometimes, you know, it's fun to listen to the pilot chatter as they're flying over. He was able to say, thanks to Flight Radar 24 and Flight Aware, that they were over the northeast corner of New Mexico, west of Clayton, at an altitude of 37,000 feet. This is what he heard. If I could just play it, I will. Yes. Have any targets up here? We just had something go right over the top of us that I hate to say this looked like a long cylindrical object. It almost looked like a cruise missile type of thing moving really fast that went right over the top of us. Now I would have thought I don't know, Steve. I thought maybe this isn't real, but if, but apparently the American Airlines confirmed that 
They said, yep, that was the transmission from Flight 2292. The FAA released a short statement. A pilot reported seeing an object over New Mexico shortly after noon local time on Sunday, February 21st. FAA air traffic controllers did not see any object in the area on their radar scope. So it is moving really fast. It is at 37,000 plus feet and it has no radar signature. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but uh, I thought I'd play that for you. It's nice when you have a, have the uh, audio. I, it's probably just, uh, chat room says, uh, just Jeff Bezos testing out some prototypes. Probably. It's the new Amazon delivery vehicle. That makes a lot of sense. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. Repeaters, it seems they are everywhere, and they are. Several thousand amateur repeaters operate on our bands from 29.5 megahertz all the way up through the microwave range. In fact, there are more amateur repeaters in the U.S. and Canada than there are AM broadcast stations. How and when did this evolve? Let's take a look at the development of repeaters in the amateur community. If you had a guess when the first repeater came on the air, what would you say? 1970? 1965? 1955? Try 1932. It was in the early 1930s that the first duplex phone relay stations, as they were then called, came into existence. W1AWW and W1HMO set up a manned relay station in a 90-foot wooden lookout tower near Springfield, Massachusetts. They used a super regenerative receiver tuned to 60 megacycles, the top of the old 5-meter band, and a modulated oscillator transmitter on 56 megacycles, the bottom of the band. Stations in Connecticut, Massachusetts, or Rhode Island could transmit on 60 megacycles and have their signals manually rebroadcast on 56 megacycles. This relay station, of course, was in operation only when amateurs were on duty at the lookout tower. Fully automatic repeater operation was still over 30 years away. In the 1950s and early 1960s, there were a few AM repeaters on the air in California. But, for the most part, VHF operations of the 1940s through the late 1960s were on AM phone in the simplex mode, with a handful of sideband stations thrown in. Using crystal-controlled transmitters with about 10 watts and single-conversion super hets, the typical VHF operator had a range of 10 to 15 miles, not counting any band openings. There were a handful of FM stations, of course, but the development of FM as a mainstream amateur mode of communication had been pushed aside by sideband. As early as 1940, QSD had construction projects for a complete 112 megacycle FM station, but then FM took a back seat in 1947 when sideband appeared. Now, however, thanks to an FCC edict, it was about to make a comeback. In 1960, the FCC issued new requirements for the users of VHF commercial frequencies. Over the period from 1960 to 1970, commercial users gradually phased in narrowband 5 kHz deviation equipment to replace the wideband 15 kHz transceivers that they had been using. Rather than revamp the older equipment to meet the new standards, they simply purchased new radios. The old radios made their way to the surplus market where they were quickly snapped up by amateurs. Converting this equipment to ham frequencies was relatively easy and soon hundreds of stations were operating on 52.525 megacycles and 146.94. Why those frequencies? Well, 52525 was the lowest 6 meter frequency on which wideband FM was allowed and 146.94 
was chosen to accommodate technicians who weren't allowed above 147 megacycles. Thus, these became the first calling channels. It wasn't long before some surplus commercial equipment was revamped into repeaters. Unlike the 1932 setup, these were fully automatic devices with no need for a control operator to be present. This, however, presented problems. Part 97 at that time contained no provision for repeater operation, and it was unclear as to whether it was legal to operate a repeater without a control operator present. Many proposals were presented to the FCC to clarify the rules in regards to repeaters. FM and repeaters received considerable publicity in 1969 when Hurricane Camille caused widespread destruction in the Gulf Coast in Virginia. This was the first time mobile rigs, FM, and repeaters were used extensively in an emergency. FM activity increased in late 1969 and early 1970 with the ARRL's announcement that it no longer considered technicians to be just experimenters, but rather full-fledged communicators. Also adding to the popularity of FM was the introduction of the first commercial rigs for the amateur market, for manufacturers such as Galaxy, Clegg, and Drake. By 1970, it was clear that coordinated legal growth of FM and repeaters was necessary. In early 1970, the FCC proposed its first repeater rules. They were as follows. On six meters, repeater inputs would be from 52.5 to 52.7, with the outputs at 53.0 to 53.2 megahertz. For two meters, repeater inputs would be authorized from 146.3 to 146.6 and the corresponding outputs would be from 146.9 to 147.2. On our 220 band, the input output subbands were 223.1 to 223.3 with the outputs at 224.1 to 224.3 and on our 440 band, Repeaters would be authorized on 447.7 to 448.9 for inputs and 449.1 to 449.3 for outputs. By the way, it looks like the 1970 FCC proposal contained a typo in the 440 MHz band segments. Whistle on or other coded access would be required. Carrier activated repeaters would not be allowed. No crossband, linked, or chain repeaters or multiple outputs would be allowed. The maximum power permitted would be 600 watts input or about 400 watts output. And finally, the FCC declined to allow fully automatic repeater operation. The proposed rules required that the licensee of a repeater station to be in attendance at the transmitter or at an authorized fixed control point and to monitor all transmissions of the station. The proposed repeater rules appeared unduly restrictive to many hams. Except for two meters, each band only had a 200 kilohertz wide input-output window. On two meters, the input-output subbands were 300 kilohertz wide, but two-thirds of the repeater output subband was above 147 megahertz where technicians weren't allowed. The FCC had still not acted on the ARRL's 1969 proposal to open all VHF frequencies to technicians. When the FCC was questioned on the legality of a technician using a repeater whose input was within the 145 to 147 technician subband, but whose output was above 147, they said the technician operator could not use the repeater. The FCC went on to say, quote, the licensee of such a repeater should sit there with the latest call book showing license class and keep his finger on the no-no button, unquote. And yes, this is an actual quote. So much for liberal repeater rules. Despite the FCC's rather restricted proposed rules, repeater operations flourished throughout 1970 and 1971. Over 200 repeaters were on the air by 1971, almost all of them in the 146 to 147 megahertz range so they could be used by technicians. But with the uncertain status of future FCC rules, the lack of national frequency standards, and the inability of technicians to operate the full two meter band, a dark cloud hung over the FM world. In our next installment, we will review the ARRL's national plan for two meter FM, as well as the revised FCC rules on repeater operation.
I hope you will join me. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for This Week in Amateur Radio. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. A March 3rd amateur radio on the International Space Station contact between young people in Moldova with an International Space Station crew member was a success. The Moldova Peace Corps was the hosting organization and 90 students aged 10 to 18 from a consortium of educational institutions, rural schools, and libraries from nine Moldovan villages participated. The Moldova Peace Corps promotes economic and civic development with a particular focus on developing local resources in rural and suburban communities. Another focus of the Moldova Peace Corps is to provide youth in Moldovan villages with access to STEM opportunities and build capacity among local teachers and librarians to implement STEM activities in their curricula. During the multipoint telebridge contact, Students took turns asking questions of astronaut Mike Hopkins, KF5LJG. ARIS team member David Payne, NA7V in Oregon, served as the relay amateur radio station. In support of this contact, the Moldova Peace Corps partnered with the staff at the Center of Excellence for Space Sciences and Technologies within the Technical University of Moldova, the U.S. Peace Corps coordinator, and the participating schools and libraries. The contact was live streamed via the MPC and UTM Facebook pages. ARRL is a partner in the ARIS program, which has kept amateur radio on the air from the ISS for 20 years. A hallmark of the ARIS program is the scheduled ham radio contacts made by ISS crew members with schools and student groups around the world. Meanwhile, students at Wyoming's Newcastle High School were flying high, at least in spirit, on Monday, March 1st. Their amateur radio contact with ISS Commander Mike Hopkins, KF5LJG, was a success at last, after their first try failed as a result of technical troubles with the equipment on board the space station. With that radio down for repairs, the QSO took place via the Russians' two-meter rig instead, and the students' questions rolled in fast, making the most of their precious 10-minute window for contact. The contact, accomplished with the help of a multipoint telebridge network, was a triumph for the high school as much as the ARIS program. It marked the first time in the ARIS program's 20-year history that it has organized a QSO with students in Wyoming. Here is what that historic contact sounded like. November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra from November Alpha 7 Victor scheduled contact. And November Alpha 7 Victor, this is November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra. I hear you loud and clear. Over. Okay, we've got you loud and clear as well. Are you ready for questions? The International Space Station is ready for questions. Over. Okay, go ahead, students. This is Trinity. How long did it take you to fully adjust to being on the ISS? Over. Hey, Trinity, before I get going, I just want to say hi to all of the Newcastle High School uh, students, everyone there. Um, I grew up in a small town just like all of you, and so it's, it's great to, to talk to you. Uh, how long did it take me to fully adjust to being on ISS? It's kind of funny. This is my second mission to ISS. My first one was seven years ago. And uh, the first one, it probably took me a couple weeks. And this time, as soon as I crossed the hatch, it felt like I'd never left. Over. This is Travis. What effects have you experienced from zero gravity? Over. Hey, Travis. Uh, yeah, quite a few effects up here. Um, so I, I have had the impacts to my eyes. Um, I also have had the, the bone loss, uh, we have the fluid shift, I get a lot of fluid shift and it causes uh, to kind of have um, uh, stuffiness and uh, like you have allergies or something like that so I get fluid in my ears. So there's definitely impacts uh, from being up here in this microgravity environment, over. This is James, what do you folks do for fun, board games, play catch in space, over? Hey James, every day in space is fun because I'm floating, I'm getting looked down at the, at the world, and so even work is fun up here. 
but, uh, you know, for our free time, we do a lot of the same things you do down on Earth. Uh, we do like to get together on a Friday night and have dinner together, and so we'll just sit around and talk. Uh, but then the other thing that we do is uh, we'll spend a lot of time uh, calling home and, and talking to our families and our friends and then also just looking out the window. Uh, playing catch up here, there's a lot of hardware and things like that, so once in a while we grab the football and throw it around, but uh, you got to be awful careful too. You don't want to break anything. Over. This is Gunner. What is the most interesting thing you have seen on a spacewalk? Over. Got it. That's a tough one. Spacewalks are amazing because when you get outside, of course, you are uh, you get to see the world without uh, without anything in between you and it, except for the uh, the visor. Uh, it's like your own little satellite. But I would say one of the more interesting things was just being in the total blackness of space uh, when when you go around the um, into the shadow and you don't see the sun and it is dark and uh, sometimes it's even hard to see the station which you're holding on to just because it's uh, it's so dark out there. Over. This is Grayson. Uh, what happens when you fly into the South Atlantic anomaly? Over. Hey Grayson, great question and uh, actually one of the things that has, oftentimes has an impact is our comm. Uh, so we use uh, uh, communication satellites that we relay through that allow us to have pretty much 24-7 communication with the ground but sometimes when we're over the South Atlantic Anomaly, uh, that doesn't work as well. Over. This is Toby. What is the most important lesson you've learned from your time in space? Over. Toby, that's an interesting question. And, you know, I knew this lesson before I got up here, but it really helped emphasize it. And that is that uh, it takes teams to, to do this kind of work. Uh, it's amazing that, you know, there's only seven of us up here on board the International Space Station, but it takes thousands and thousands of people all across the world to, to make this space station operate. So teams are incredibly important. Over. This is Nate. What types of organisms do you grow or use in space? Over. Nate, there are all types of organisms that are up here. So we've got uh, a lot of plants that are growing right now. We've got, um, uh, let's see, what some of the, we've got pak choy and amari um, mustard are growing. Uh, we also, I just was doing some uh, experiments on some worms and uh, seeing the effects on their muscles in uh, microgravity. And hopefully when we learn about that, that'll help us uh, learn about the effects on humans in microgravity as well, and even uh, down on Earth. Over. This is Trinity again. I'm asking a question for Mrs. Cummings' second grade class. How big is the International Space Station and what is inside? Are there bedrooms, gym, kitchen? Over. Trinity, great question. The International Space Station is about the size of a four or five bedroom house. Um, but we don't necessarily have bedrooms like you're used to. Our bedrooms are more like a little broom closet. Uh, otherwise, we do have a, uh, two toilets on board the International Space Station. We don't have a dedicated gym. We don't have a dedicated kitchen. Most of our modules, we do a lot of other things in there. So, for example, I'm down here right now in the Russian segment, and their treadmill is right next to their crew quarter, which is right next to their toilet, which is right next to their dining table. And so it's the same room, but it just has multi-functions. Over. Travis here. Is it weird not being able to experience night and day the same as you would on Earth? Over. It is a little weird when you see so many sunrises and sunsets, but in general it's not too bad because inside the station we don't have a lot of windows, and so you don't see all of those sunrises and sunsets that often uh, because they keep us pretty busy. And so, you know, we wake up in the morning, we turn on the lights, and uh, when it's time to go to bed at night, we turn out the lights. And so that can feel kind of normal. Over. James again. What research is currently being conducted? Is it biological? Over. Yeah, James, uh, we're, we are doing a ton of science up here. You know, within a one six-month period, we'll do between 200 and 300 experiments. I already mentioned we're doing some on worms. Uh, we've had heart cells up here. We've got, uh, we do a lot of fluid types experiments. Um, and we are also uh, experiments as well. And so, for example, my, uh, my crewmate up here is doing an a experiment with his diet and seeing if, if that helps uh, prevent bone loss and um, the muscle loss and things of that nature. So there's uh, just an unbelievable amount of science that's happening every, every day, 24-7 uh, up here. Over. This is Gunner again. Have you ever lost something on a spacewalk? Over. Gunner, that is one of our biggest concerns when we are out on a spacewalk is losing something. So when you go outside the door, you all, you have everything has a tether attached to it, including you. Um, and so I can say, fortunately, I've never lost anything out on a spacewalk. However, on my uh, last space or no, two spacewalks ago, 
we actually uh, had to jettison something, so my crewmate got to take a cover off of an antenna and then throw that away, which is something unique we don't get to do very often. And then I'll also say that I have been lost, believe it or not, outside on the space station, because uh, without any up or down, and sometimes at night, it can get confusing as to where you are on the space station. Over. Grayson again, since space flight associated neuroocular syndrome can affect mission success, does the research currently being conducted on the retina of mice take priority over other experiments? Over. You know, it, uh, Grayson, I, I don't think it necessarily takes priority over it. Um, again, we have so many different experiments on here that are going on aboard the International Space Station at any one time that this is just one of many, and, and they all have a lot of priority. So. Uh, you know, we're still able to continue to do our, our jobs, even though, as I mentioned, I've had these symptoms. And so we got to, um, you know, we, we do have experiments that are constantly looking at that, uh, but it doesn't necessarily take priority over others. Over. This is Toby again. What is the weirdest solution to a problem that you've tried that actually worked? Over. Hey, Toby, I was out on a spacewalk seven years ago, and we were having trouble getting uh, this connector connected and there was a button that wouldn't go down. And so uh, they came out and they just told me to hit it with something. And so that was, uh, that was a little strange to do out there because you don't want to break anything, but uh, I got to hit it um, and uh, it actually worked. Over. This is Nate. What is the most dangerous aspect about living and working in space? Over. Hey Nate, probably the biggest uh, uh, danger about living and working in space is one, getting here, and two, coming home. So that rocket ride up and then the re-entry through the atmosphere are very dangerous times, and that's typically where most of uh, the accidents have occurred. Uh, on the other hand, when we are up here, we are very concerned about uh, emergencies like a depressed scenario where we're, we're uh, venting atmosphere out into space or a fire on board. Uh, that can also be very dangerous for us because we can't just run outside and call the fire department. Over. Trinity here. What is the most exciting thing you have experienced so far? Over. Trinity, that's a tough one to, to put as one thing as being the most exciting. I would say uh, both of my launches and, and uh, my one landing so far were extremely exciting. All four of my spacewalks were very exciting. And then I got to tell you, just living up here again, uh, every day when I get to look out the window and see the Earth, uh, it's it's just amazing, and it never gets old. And uh, so, I would say though those spacewalks and launches and landings are uh, probably the most exciting thing. Over. Okay, back to Jim for closing. All right, thank you again, Commander Hopkins, for taking the time to speak with us for this once in a lifetime opportunity. From all of us here in New Castle, Wyoming, 73. Okay, the uh, space station has passed over the horizon. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. This is W2XBS with the propagation forecast for Saturday, March 6, 2021. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that we saw one day during the February 25th to March 3rd reporting week, it was Monday, March 1st, with no sunspots. So, the average daily sunspot number declined slightly from 19.6 to 18.9. Two new sunspot groups, numbered 2806 and 2807, appeared on Tuesday, March 2nd. Average daily solar flux increased only slightly during the reporting week from 75.7 to 76.7. The average planetary A index softened slightly from 16 to 14.7, and the middle latitude average went from 12.4 to 10.4. The geomagnetic indicators remained somewhat active due to persistent solar winds. The most active day occurred on Monday, when Alaska's high-latitude College A index reached 34. Spaceweather.com reported a G2 class geomagnetic storm on Monday, aided by a significant crack in the Earth's magnetic field. Although activity was otherwise moderate this week, the March 1st event was the largest storm since a G3 event 94 weeks earlier on May 14, 2019. Looking ahead, the predicted solar flux for the next 15 days is 78 on March 6th, 78 on March 7th to the 9th. 72 on March 10th and 11th, 71, 72, 70, 71, 72, and 71 on March 12th to the 17th, and 
73, 76, 75, 76, 78, and 81 on March 18th to the 23rd. The predicted planetary A index is 20 and 15 on March 6th and 7th. It'll jump to 10 on March 8th and 9th, 8, 5, 15, 10, and 5 on March 10th to the 14th, respectively, 5, 8, 5, and 18 on March 15th to the 18th, It'll be 20 on March 19th and 20th, and 18, 12, and 8 on March 22nd to the 23rd. Time now for the AMSAT report. Voice and CW are a lot of fun on satellites, but maybe you'd like to try your hand at working a digital satellite. A few are available. Falcon Sat 3, NO-103, NO-104, and occasionally the International Space Station, once the antenna issue is fixed, all have APRS. NO84 has PSK31 active continuously. The ARRL Worked All States or WAS award only has one endorsement for satellite. You can mix and match CW, voice, and digital to earn the award. Some have done it all on digital. If you're having trouble finding a state, try looking on one of the APRS satellites and make the digital contact that way. A fixed antenna at about 45 degrees for receive, another for transmit, should work. Holding a beam is a little difficult when you're trying to type on your laptop or handheld device. You might be surprised that the elusive contact you were trying to find turns up on a digital mode. You can also work the APRS satellites with an egg beater type antenna for transmit and receive. Digital is a little easier than voice and CW contacts. The MSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. Members of Germany's AMSAT organization, AMSAT-D-L, in cooperation with the Sternwart Bochum Institute in Bochum, Nordheim, Westfalen, Germany, has been using the Institute's 20-meter, 65-foot dish diameter dish to listen directly to signals from the probes in the Mars orbit. Signals have been copied from the Chinese Tianwen-1 and the Hope Emirates Mars Mission spacecraft, now orbiting Mars, and transmitting in the 8.4 gigahertz band. Recordings of the signals can be heard on YouTube with regular updates by following at msatdl, that's A-A-M-S-A-T-D-L, on Twitter. In 2003, radio amateurs added phase-locked receivers in the 2.3, 5.8, and 10.4 gigahertz amateur bands as well as in the 8.4 gigahertz receiver mode. There's also an S-band of 2.4 gigahertz amateur transmitter running 250 watts PEP, peak envelope power. In 2006, the dish was used to copy signals from the Voyager 1 at a distance of nearly 15 billion kilometers, or 9.3 billion miles. Foundations of Amateur Radio Amateur Radio lives and dies with the ionosphere. It's drilled into you when you get your license. It's talked about endlessly. The sun impacts on it. Life is bad when the solar cycle is low and great when it's not. There's sunspots, solar K and A indices, flux, different ionospheric bands, and tools online that help you predict what's possible and how likely it is depending on the time of day, the frequency, your location, and the current state of the sun. If that's not enough, the geomagnetic field splits a radio wave in the ionosphere into two separate components ordinary and extraordinary waves. All that complexity aside, there's at least one thing we can all agree on. A radio wave can travel from your station, bounce off the ionosphere, come back to Earth and do it again. This is known as a hop or a skip. If conditions are right, you can hop all the way around the globe. I wanted to know how big a hop might be. If you know that it's a certain distance, then you can figure out if you can talk to a particular station or not because the hop might be on the Earth, or it might be in the ionosphere. Simple enough, right? My initial research unearthed the idea that a hop was 4,000 kilometers. So, if you're attempting to talk to a station at 2,000 kilometers, or at 6,000 kilometers, you couldn't do that with a hop of 4,000 kilometers. If you've been on HF, we both know that that's not the case. If you need proof, which you really should be asking for, you should check out what the propagation looks like for any FT8 station, or any whisper beacon over time, and you'll notice that it's not 4,000 kilometers. 
Just like the crazy network of interacting parameters associated with propagation, the distance of a hop can vary. Not a little, but a lot. In 1962, in the Journal of Geophysical Research, D.B. Muldrew and R.G. Maliphant contributed an article titled Long Distance One Hop Ionospheric Radio Wave Propagation. They found that in temperate regions such a hop might be 7,500 kilometres, and in equatorial regions even 10,000 kilometres. I'm mentioning this because this was based on observations and measurements. They used frequency sweeps from 2 to 49 megahertz, though they called them megacycles, using 100 kilohertz per second. That is, over the duration of a second, the frequency changed by 100 kilohertz. So each sweep took nearly 8 minutes, using only 15 kilowatts. So substantial gear, not to mention expense and availability. Oh, computers, yes, they use those too. A 3-ton behemoth called an IBM 650. Mind you, that's only the base unit, consisting of a card reader, a power supply, and a console holding a magnetic drum unit. You know I'm going somewhere with this, right? Today, you can do the same measurements with a $5 computer and a $20 receiver. For a transmitter, any HF-capable radio will do the trick, though you might not be transmitting long if you stray outside the amateur bands. For power, 5 watts is plenty to get the job done. My point is that there is a debate around the future of our hobby and why modes like FT8 are such a controversial topic in some communities. I'm here to point out that since that publication in 1962, our hobby has made some progress, and we can improve on the work done by people who came before us. We could build a globe-spanning real-time propagation visualization tool. We already have the data, and modes like FT8 keep feeding in more. If you're inclined, you could even make such a plot in real time for your own station. So, how long is a hop? You'll just have to find out. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. Back in the 1920s, when electronic breadboarding often used a real wooden breadboard swiped from the kitchen in the dark of night, a limited supply of commercial electronic components inspired ham radio hobbyists to roll their own capacitors, inductors, switches, and whatever else was needed to build a transmitter. Today, Andy Flowers, callsign Kilo Zero Sierra Mike, recreates early transmitters using the same techniques and components that were used back in the day, and he uses the transmitters on air. Andy shows how it's done in a video on the Antique Wireless Museum YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and type in Antique Wireless Museum Kilo Zero Sierra Mike. With many in-person ham fests cancelled due to the pandemic, some radio amateurs in Raleigh, North Carolina, have come up with a way to adapt with a tailgate ham fest in an unused shopping center parking area. The event grew out of the so-called Ham Radio Taco Thursdays, begun many years ago by ARRL Life member Alan Pitagoff, AB4OZ. Alan had to put his event on hold when the pandemic erupted. It was suggested that hams could gather and socialize at a safe distance by having a Taco Thursday with the taco truck outside in an adjacent empty parking lot. That event was a success, with participants remaining at their vehicles and bringing their own chairs. That success inspired holding a tailgate ham fest in the same spot, and it's now turned into a monthly event called the AB4OZ Ham Fest. Alan said Taco Thursday started collecting more people, up to 15 or so, and when Taco Bell closed due to the pandemic, the event moved to a Thursday on the air net with one requirement, that participants could not talk about the pandemic or any related topic. The Tailgate Ham Fest was established at the new location and held once a month on Saturday at 10 a.m. I think this is a great, uplifting, and positive experience for all of us hams to get out and socialize, participant Charles Murray, KI4DCR, said. We might not be able to have a big ham fest, but these micro-tailgate ham fests might be the future for a good while. I've met a lot of good people. 
There's a lot of cool stuff out here. The weather's great, you know, and there's plenty of space for everybody to be socially distanced. I think it's fantastic. Amateur Radio Ingenuity has helped lead the development of a prototype solar panel designed to transmit electricity to Earth from outer space. Launched in May of 2020 aboard a Pentagon drone, the device known as the Photovoltaic Direct Current to Radio Frequency Antenna Module, or PRAM, PRAM for short, Project Coordinator Paul Jaffe, KJ4IKI, said in a recent CNN report that the PRAM underwent a successful test recently by the United States Department of Defense at the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. He said that the PRAM produces about 10 watts of energy for transmission but could be scaled up bringing the promise of transmitting energy to the power grid back on Earth. The panel uses the blue waves of light in space, which become diffused when entering the Earth's atmosphere, it captures these waves, which are more powerful than sunlight on Earth, and retains that energy. The new panel hasn't yet sent back any power to Earth, but scientists say the tests have shown that it works. The concept is to beam microwaves to Earth for conversion into electricity wherever that's needed. Paul told the CNN that the next move would be to expand its ability to recollect any more from sunlight to prepare it for the microwave transportation back to Earth. Team co-leader Dennis DePuma said the technology would be especially useful in regions where a natural disaster has taken down the power grid. The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between ARRL and the FCC to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. In January 2021, Volunteer monitors reported 2,277 hours monitoring the HF frequencies and 2,162 hours monitoring VHF frequencies and above. The Volunteer Monitor Coordinator issued 11 advisory notices. An advisory notice is an attempt to resolve rule violation issues informally before FCC intervention. They are as follows. Operators in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Centralia, Washington, Edmond, Oklahoma, Fontana, California, and Orleans, Massachusetts received advisories concerning operation outside their license class. An operator in Thornhill, Tennessee received an advisory concerning interference. An operator in Ridgely, Tennessee received an advisory regarding excessive bandwidth. Operators in Miami, Florida, Friendly, West Virginia, Collinsville, Illinois, and Keensburg, New Jersey received advisories concerning station identification issues. An operator in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania received an advisory regarding improper use of a linear amplifier. The ARRL had two meetings in January with FCC Enforcement Bureau personnel. Here's this week's listing of upcoming ARRL online webinars you can attend. Remember that the ARRL Learning Network webinars are a member's only benefit. You can visit the ARRL Learning Network webpage to register, check on upcoming webinars, and view previously recorded sessions. Technicians, Life Beyond Repeaters, hosted by Anthony Lucier, K8ZT. Maybe you just received your technician class license, or perhaps you have had it for a while and are burned out waiting for sparse FM repeater contacts. Take a new look at the possibilities available to you beyond repeaters. Explore Tech HF and 6 meter privileges for SSB, CW, and digital modes such as FT8, RIDI, and PSK31 to expand your operating modes and your station's outreach. Explore other VHF and UHF uses including SSB, satellites, FM simplex, digital modes, contesting, and more. This webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, March 9th, 2021 at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1800 UTC. The Art and Science of Operating Ultra Portable, hosted by Mike Molina, KN6EZE. Ultra portable operation, or being able to carry your radio over distances, for example, in a backpack, is quickly growing in popularity. Whether for SOTA, POTA, backcountry survival, or just spending time in nature, Learning how to operate Ultra Portable is a fun and rewarding experience. In this presentation, Mike, KN6EZE, will cover the basics of Ultra Portable operating for both the new and experienced ham radio operator. This webinar is scheduled to be held on Tuesday, April 6th, 2021 at 8 p.m. Eastern or 0 hours UTC on Friday, 
April 7th. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change. Visit the Learning Network webpage for the most up-to-date information. Amateur radio operators from around the world recently celebrated the discovery of the controversial planet Pluto, which was first seen in 1930 by astronomer Clyde Tombaugh. Special event station W7P with P for Pluto was activated last month by the Northern Arizona DX Association for the Pluto Anniversary Countdown special event. There will be an event counting down each of the next 10 years, ending with the centennial year of 2030. This was particularly special event for Doug Tombaugh, N3PDT, nephew of the astronomer who made the discovery. Doug marked the occasion by operating along with three other amateurs as W7P Slant Zero, logging 1,191 contacts. He said he especially enjoyed talking with other amateurs who either knew his uncle or were involved in other activities related to Pluto. Countdown coordinator Bob Works, nf 7 e said in all, 15 amateurs logged more than 7,000 contacts from their home QTH, as well as from the communications trailer on the grounds of the Lowell Observatory, where Clyde first made his discovery. The same countdown begins again next year on February 12th, the last Saturday before the February 18th anniversary itself. Originating from Albany, New York, and distributed worldwide, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Over the years I've been a tower climber, I've had to work at night. And when I tell people I climb at night, I usually get more comments from that than I do from climbing in general. Most of the towers I've been on are close to populated areas. And since most populated areas are full of street lights, I've noticed that most of these towers are easily seen at night and I often do not use my headlamp while climbing up the tower. Now this may only apply to towers less than 200 feet tall or job sites on the tower lower than 200 feet. Since the light from street lights shines upwards, even a small of amount of light is usually makes the tower stand out boldly against a black sky. Now it may not appear when you first arrive at the tower that it's easy to see, but after your eyes adjust to the dark, it will become a lot easier. When climbing downwards, the lighting is different, and here is where I use my headlamp. I wear a headband type flashlight I purchased at our local Walmart for about $8. I also bring along extra AA batteries. If you were going to do a job that would last more than 20 minutes or so, or higher than ambient light would allow you to climb upwards without extra light, I would recommend a style of light with an external gel cell type battery. Also, a surprising amount of light can come from the moon. And when you get above the street lights, you may be surprised how well you can see with no added light. Some climbers do not like to work on wet towers, which is understandable. Lots of times at night, dew forms on towers, which can make them dripping wet. And I've noticed over the years that this wetness usually only goes to about 20 or 30 feet or so above the ground and then stops. Some of the best scenery I've seen is late at night on a tower. At night, fog can make the visibility poor on the ground, but often stops before you get to the spot on the tower you need to get to. Climbing above the fog on a night with a full moon can provide some spectacular views as the fog looks thick enough like you could step off the tower and walk on top of it. Too bad this would be nearly impossible to photograph. Finally, I've noticed that Mother Nature tends to calm down at night, say after midnight. If there's a job you've been needing to get done, but wind or storms have kept you off the tower, check out the weather after midnight, then give it a try. Don't forget that ground crew, and never climb alone, especially at night. Also, don't forget extra batteries for your flashlight, and don't use the kind of flashlight you hold in your hand. Spotlights on the ground will only blind you on the tower, so don't let people shine lights up at you. When I do a night job, I often call the local police to let them know I'll be there so I don't get a light shine in my eyes. Plus, if they're bored and the donut shops are closed, they may even offer to be a ground crew for you. Now remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. ARRL Chief Executive Officer David Minster NA2AA will keynote the QSO Today Virtual Ham Exposition March 13th and 14th weekend. With more details on the upcoming keynote address, 
we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from ARRL headquarters. Minster's Talk, part of an 80-plus speaker lineup, will begin at 2000 UTC, that's 3 p.m. Eastern Time, on March 13th. His appearance will highlight ARRL's featured role of the Expo, which will also include an Ask the ARRL Lab session. ARRL is a QSO Today virtual ham expo partner. In his keynote, Minster will share his enthusiasm for advancing amateur radio and highlight current ARRL initiatives to engage and inspire the current generation of hams. At the ARRL Expo booths, Ask the ARRL Lab, lab staffers will answer questions live, offering tips about projects or suggestions to improve your station or address problems. Four live group kit building workshops also will take place with workshop instructors guiding participants through building a variety of kits which are available for purchase. Everything you want to know is on the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo website, www.qsotodayhamexpo.com. Minster, who assumed the ARRL headquarters leadership position last September, has launched major projects and assembled teams to foster innovation and individual skill development in radio technology and communications. In his keynote, Minster will share his enthusiasm for advancing amateur radio and highlight current ARRL initiatives to engage and inspire the current generation of hams. His presentation topics will include ARRL's Digital Transformation, which promises to bring new value to ARRL members. An all-in digital approach will improve the way members access and engage with content, programs, and systems. The ARRL Learning Center, a hub for members to discover the many facets of amateur radio and develop practical knowledge and skills. Increasing video content, opening opportunities for amateur radio content creators and member volunteers to learn, stay informed, and keep connected. Improving training and tools to engage radio clubs, emergency communication volunteers, and students. Attendees can also learn about product review equipment testing by the lab, see a presentation on how the lab can help hams with RFI problems, and tour W1AW, the Hiram Percy Maxim Memorial Station, virtually. ARRL booth staff will also point attendees to helpful resources from across membership benefits, services, and programs. Representing the ARRL lab will be lab manager Ed Hare, W1RFI, test engineer Bob Allison, WB1GCM, senior laboratory engineer Zach Lau, W1VT, RFI engineer Paul Cianciello, W1VLF, and W1AW station manager Joe Garcia, NJ1Q. Between all of them, they have over 100 years of experience at ARRL headquarters. QSO Today Virtual Ham Exposition Chairman Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, also announced four live group kit building workshops. Workshop instructors will guide participants through building a variety of kits which will be available for purchase and delivered prior to the expo so attendees can build them at home. Attendees unable to participate during the live sessions can order and build kits by watching the workshop videos during the on-demand period that follows the Expo through April 12th. Workshop kit prices range from $15 to $30. Early bird discount tickets and links to purchase kits can be found at the QSO Today Expo website. These workshops will include Building the NS40 QRP Transmitter, a 14-component 5 watts transmitter for 7.030 MHz with instructors David Kripe, NM0S, and Virginia Smith, NV5F. The Learn to Solder workshop will introduce the basic tools and techniques of building electronic kits. Participants will build a 20-meter transmitter kit with instructors Rex Harper, W1REX, and Stephen Hauser, N1SH. Building the Crick Key, 
A simple CW keyer with paddle, suitable for home and field use with instructor Joe Eisenberg, K0NEB. And the Mini Sudden Receiver, a pocket and mint tin friendly direct conversion 20 meter receiver with instructors Rex Harper, W1REX, and Stephen Hauser, N1SH. Dan Heilman, W05WO, is a ham with a sky high idea. A former airline pilot turned middle school teacher has another project on the runway. He's planning to start a podcast this summer devoted to hams who enjoy being in the air as much as they like being on the air. He's planning to bring hams on board for rag chews about fly-ins, the expeditions, FAA flight safety tips, and projects that combine being a pilot and an amateur radio operator. He's especially interested in stories of famous and not so famous hams in the sky. He said in an email that the podcast is just a fun way to connect already connected hobbies, and he can't guarantee there won't be more than a few corny jokes along the way. He said he hopes the half hour bi-weekly podcast will inspire youngsters to think about flying and radio as two related hobbies. He's working with a ham radio friend who's a former Air Force pilot, and together they're hoping to, well, get things off the ground. Dan welcomes any and all ideas. You can reach him via email at flyingham78 at gmail.com. And now, with our final story for this week from Southgate Vibes, here is Steve Richards, Gulf War Hotel Papa Echo. The UK regulator Ofcom sent an engineer out just 30 minutes after receiving a report of interference to unprotected license-exempt devices, and they say they treated the case as high priority. Many customers in a supermarket car park could not use their key fobs to open their cars. In their report, Ofcom said... Ofcom's Spectrum Management Centre, based in Baldock, Hertfordshire, provides a 24-hour service to industry and to members of the public by monitoring the radio spectrum. This service also allows people to report radio interference. On Friday the 26th of February, an officer from Hertfordshire Police contacted Ofcom to make them aware of the problems at the supermarket car park. Car key fobs, like lots of other everyday technology, use radio spectrum to operate around an about 433 MHz. On rare occasions, faulty or unauthorised equipment can interfere with nearby technology and prevent it from working properly, such as in the case of these customers' fobs. Due to the nature and scale of the problem, Ofcom assigned this as a high-priority case and sent out a local engineer who was soon on the scene to investigate the problem. He used a spectrum analyzer, a piece of equipment which measures the airwaves and detects any radio signals that shouldn't be there. However, at that particular moment, the problem wasn't actually happening, and customers were able to lock and unlock their vehicles successfully. So, Ofcom asked staff at the supermarket to get in touch if any more customers reported further issues over the weekend. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater K2RHI on 146.940 MHz, serving the Tri-Cities of New York State's capital region from Mount Refinesk in Brunswick, New York. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.